Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the latest of the GA Coach webinar series. Um, tonight's session it promises to be a really, really interesting session. So tonight's topic is practical positive psychology for well-being and motivation. And we have two presenters. First of all, we have Dr. Kira Lusty. Kira is a lecturer in applied sports and exercise psychology at Warford IT, and she's course leader for the MSc in, in applied sport and exercise psychology. Uh, she's an accredited um, professional member of the Irish Institute of Sport uh, in the area of sports psychology delivery. She works with a range of Olympic athletes in preparation for what is now Tokyo 2021. Um, she currently works with modern pentathlon, track and field, jump and flat jockeys and various GA teams. Uh, she's also provides a sports psychology service to the jockey pathway and that provides sports science and sports psychology support to all licensed jockeys. The Pathways primary goal is to ensure that all jockeys would have access to professional sports science support system, which will enable them to make the most of their ability, achieve the highest standards and prolong their careers in racing. Jerry Fitzpatrick is no stranger to Gaelic Games and to Gaelic Games coaches. And again, Jerry is involved is at the Department of Health, Sport and Exercise Science at Warford IT. Uh, Jerry's research is in applied sports psychology and also in the, in the area of strength and conditioning. And again, the, the current program that they work on is MSc in applied sports psychology. So over the next 40 minutes or so, Kira and Jerry are going to present um, the, the various elements of, of this session. If you recall, for those of you who've been on the session before, we have a Q&A button. Um, it's a speech bubble with a question mark in it. So you're going to click on that button. You can type in any question that you want to have for Kira and Jerry. And what we'll do is at the end of this, at the end of the presentation session, we'll, we'll cover all the questions together. So if, if as you're going along, questions come to you, just top, just type them into the Q&A button and we'll get to them uh, at, at the end of the presentation session. So Kira, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thanks, Peter. Um, thanks a million for the invite tonight and thanks to everybody for logging in on what's a wet and soggy evening here in Waterford. Hope everybody's doing well. We're just going to chat tonight about well-being, practical well-being strategies and some practical resources and some take-home resources and messages to really help you be your best coach and players in this particular challenging environment that we're in. I suppose really the key is now is to aid your transition to play and give you some strategies and resources to aid the transition to play for your players as well, if you're a coach as well. So some, I, some ideas, some suggestions to, to navigate the uncertainty as we actually transition over the next couple of weeks to actual play. So just to give you a brief overview then. So responses to the pandemic, so looking after our own well-being and looking after the well-being of our players to prepare them for performance. Jerry's going to focus on goal setting strategies. We'll wrap up and then a Q&A session at the end. Um, so just really, I suppose, to kind of give you an idea really from, a, I suppose, a coaching perspective as well, or for players or just from a general life perspective, really in times of adversity, there are really three general responses to an adversity and anxiety. And some people you've probably seen and some players you've probably seen have actually probably thrived through C19. They enjoyed the downtime, they enjoyed training at home themselves, they were able to maintain their motivation, able to um, get up every day, keep their daily routine and were resilient under, under this actual adversity. Most of us are probably sitting here in the middle box that we're anxious about the shape of things to come, and um, we're unsure about what life might actually look like after the after when we open to uh, come out of full lockdown. Um, and we're just unsure about how we feel about certain things because they do, messages are changing on, on, a, on a daily basis. So some players are sitting in the middle box. Then we'll have other players that have actually found this an extremely challenging time, particularly maybe ones that um, really really got motivation from their players and being with around their teammates and that was taken away from them. Well, we have to remember, I suppose, you're able to recognise first off maybe your own response to this pandemic and then really be able to recognise what, what players are responding in different ways. But also remember that in 10, 5, 10, 15 years that this C19 is just going to be a dot in our particular lives, that things could always change so quickly. But now we actually feel this more acutely. We're much more aware of that because everything came to a halt one day in March and now we've been asked to emerge from this enforced type of cocoon as well. So be patient with yourself as you transition and really play the long game. But this is different this time, this year, uh, and this format is completely unique to, to what we're going through. 
at this particular situation as well. But really, again, be thankful then uh, as humans that we've actually cultivated an ability to really be able to overcome adversity and thrive despite our external circumstances. So we're going to touch on that a, a little bit further down the presentation. But I suppose one take home message is can you recognise your own response and can you recognise some of the responses of your players as well? Some key considerations why we transition back to play as well, that the C-19 pandemic is really having a profound effect on all aspects of society, including mental health and physical activity. And really this mental health effect will not be felt for maybe week, weeks or months down the line. We're not sure how as a society, how we're actually going to respond. And then we're not sure how as a sport and society, how our players will respond as well. But something else is, as a coach that you'll have to really need to consider is that this enforced break will mean that some players are maybe to uh, have decided or will have to actually retire from the sport as well. So using these lead in weeks to actually return into training and return into play is a good time to reach out and connect with those particular players who may actually have to retire. And then some players may have lost their job. They've been working on the front line. They have family that are on the front line or they really have career and employment uncertainty over the next few weeks, months, years. They're unsure what's going to happen. So the players that left you in March are very different to the players that are coming back to you over the next coming weeks. So really keep those considerations in mind. And that, again, your role and your job as a coach, you might have uncertainty in your own life. So you have to negotiate this in, your, in your, the best possible way as well. And just kind of things to, things to consider that lots of players can manage on their own through this particular situation, but they don't have to as well. So really normalising the anxieties that they're feeling at this time. And we are feeling more anxious, but it's just that this is an unprecedented time. So those feelings of anxiety or those heightened levels of anxiety are very normal to a very abnormal situation because lots of us are facing into financial security. You may have actually lost some family members or friends and so have your players as well. So seeking out support, SOS is really important. And you'll, you'll know this and you begin to recognise this if you, as, you, as you've connected with your players over, over the last couple of weeks, that some are responding with decreased sleep and, um, you know, decreased appetite, or some players are actually responding with the complete opposite, increased sleep and increased appetite. But all of these are normal responses and there's lots of help out there. Out there. So what I would do is encourage maybe your players to actually be their own case managers over the next coming weeks. So ask them what type of help would be helpful over the next few weeks. So really encouraging them to think about, reflect on their own performances, what they need. And it could be just engaging and linking to sp sports science, sports services that are available in your own club or within your own team. So maybe they need some physio, maybe they need some physical therapy, need, maybe they need some rehabilitation. Some players will have overtrained, some players will have undertrained over this break. Maybe they need some psychological support, so performance support clinical support, maybe they need some nutrition support. So ask them to reflect and think about what type of support services they particularly need and actually how you can help them address those concerns over the couple, couple these couple of weeks. So now is a good time to link to those supports. And if you're a coach, maybe maybe you need some of those supports or so reflect and think what support services you need and, and engage with those supports. And really, I suppose from a coaching perspective, again, you also may be negotiating stress, loss and uncertainty at this particular time as well. So you have to make a decision to lead and coach in a way for yourself that is sustainable during this transition to play as well. And probably, I just love this idea, we see it all the time when we're on uh, airplanes, that put on your own oxygen mask first. You cannot care for anybody else. You can't coach, you, know, you can't give to somebody else if you're neglecting your own self-care and your own needs. So look after what you, you need for your own needs over this particular time, because you also may be facing uncertainty in the actual future as well and dealing with your own anxieties. And give what you can back to your club and to your players and to your team. So there's a lot of adaptation happening at the, at the moment, and that really can give players and teams the competitive edge. So it's I just love this, I love this quote. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one that's most responsive to change. And if ever we've been asked to change and think differently about, about things, it's been during it's been during C19. So remember that adaptation and adaption to things is being flexible in your mindset as well. And thinking about thinking and putting strategies into place about how things may shape up in the future as well. So 
being aware of any thinking traps that you might actually fall into. So being aware of your own self-talk and your self-dialogue is really important. Moving away from black or white thinking, we really genuinely have to move, in, <coughs> move into the gray and think about, is there a different way of viewing this particular situation? And there's nothing more that like C19 has really genuinely challenged us to think, to, to think differently. So again, be kind and gentle to yourself at this time, because this transition to play may not go ahead as planned at all, but that's okay. It's absolutely all new and it's all a process. What's really important is that you keep moving forward and you set goals. And that's what Jerry's going to talk about. And some days are going to be easy during this transition period. Some days are going to be a struggle, but it's really important that you just keep showing up and encourage your players to do the same. So it's important, maybe you don't feel, you don't feel as motivated as you did in March or, or February when you're back in that pre-season training. That's completely normal, but show up. And again, the consistency will breed that motivation that will actually get you moving again and help you to adapt and be flexible in your actual mindset again. And ask yourself, can you shift away from your own thinking comfort zone as well? What process can help you move into your learning zone as well? So asking yourself questions is a, is a good way to get yourself into that particular learning zone and not just sit in the actual comfort zone. And this is something that's kind of an analogy that I, I really like it, that it's practical positive psychology and practical positive thinking, because sometimes just using the words positive psychology can kind of feel disingenuous to something when we've been struggling with something. But can we think more practically about something? Can you think more usefully about a particular situation? Or is there a different, a different way to view a particular situation? And again, once you begin to reframe your thinking and your thoughts and maybe reflect it in a question, it allows you to get a different spin or allows you to get a different perspective on a particular situation. And I often kind of use the analogy of that it's optimi optimism with a dog lead. And it's that we're still moving forwards and you're chasing a nook and I suppose looking for that sweet spot of moving forwards, but it's not absolute blind optimism and just going ahead with something for the sake of it because you, you're just hoping for the best that it's going to work out. So move forwards, but slow and steady at a, at a meaningful pace. And Jerry will kind of talk, talk about that as well. And when you're in this zone, using practical psychological kind of tips, I suppose. So challenge any irrationality or thinking by asking questions. Again, is this a useful or helpful thought? Is this helping me right now? Generally, when you have to think about something and reflect and change it and ask yourself a question, it isn't a thinking strategy that's actually working for you. So resilience really isn't about just positive thinking. It's about recognising that there's an alternative way to view the particular situation as well. And again, it's really difficult to be positive all the time, particularly in challenging situations. But can you be more practical in your thinking? And if we use these strategies, there's massive growth in challenging situations. And when we focus on our strengths, so that's a practical positive psychology, we, uh, we often get what we want to achieve and we often tap into why we actually want to achieve it, which allows us to be more motivated to actually work towards actually achieving it. And again, Jerry's going to tap into that area as well. But it's also important to engage that we might need a little bit of help along the way. So it's absolutely important that we focus on what we can, can control, how you think, how you feel and you behave. You may need a little bit of help to actually achieve those things and achieve that change in your actual thinking as well. So some kind of strategies around healthy thinking habits for well-being and performances. So again, training your mindset is really important. And thinking about your mindset, and it's often the last thing that we think about, and sports psychology is often the, 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 the last thing in the door and the first thing that's out the door often when things don't go well. But even I've heard uh, Dr. Hannah McCormick say this on a, on a podcast this week, that even the fastest player on the team will still do sprint drills. And that really, I suppose, is a great analogy about thinking about mental skills training. So even the, the person who's the most resilient still needs to engage in some mental skills training. And the basic premise of this is determining what you can control, how you think about situations, how you feel, and ultimately what you behave, how you behave and how you perform are all under your control. And focusing on that and thinking about that and letting go of everything else that's outside of that allows you to maybe alleviate some of the anxieties. So ask yourself, can you control this? And if you can't, remind yourself that you can cope with it as well. So another important thing is identify your actual fears as well. So again, give your permission to feel those fears, but ask yourself, is there an alternative ways to feel about those fears? 
or something sometimes I often use this strategy when I'm, I'm working with athletes is we often say what's the best that can happen what's the worst that can happen and actually what's the most likely thing that's going to happen so confronting and challenging those fears head on and actually writing and engaging in, in actual practical positive strategies to identify and challenge them as well again we've had an awful lot of time at home and begin again to differentiate between ruminating and actually problem solving. Sometimes we think just because we're thinking about things over and over again, over again that we're actually helping to solve the problem. We're not, we're just ruminating. We're not actually coming up with actually any problem solving strategies. So Polya created his famous four step kind of aid to help prob people problem solve. So first step one is understand the problem. Two is devise a plan. So translate what that plan is actually going to look like in, in actions and behaviours carry out the plan and then look back and reflect and check and interpret did it actually go what could you do better how would you manage it but sometimes just working one problem at a time as opposed to multitasking is, is, is much more important so understand the problem devise a plan carry out the plan and look back and check and interpret the actual plan as well other simple daily things you can do are also create a plan to actually manage your stress so it's a plan to manage your stress so Reflect on what works for you in relation to stress. And what we, what I, I suppose C19 has actually asked us to really think about what brings you joy? What brings you simple joy? It's simple things that are, uh, that, that are I suppose, we, we've been at, we're looking for. We want to walk in our local areas. We want to be able to drive in our county. We want to be able to get to the beach. It's really simple things that bring us an awful lot of joys. Or it could be going for a, a coffee or meeting a friend for a socially distant walk. What are the things that bring you sim simple joy? And do them and engage in them to help manage your actual stress levels. And again, we don't always learn from experiences about how to manage our stress unless we actually reflect on that situation. So if it's something, it might be at the end of the day, but did that work? Did it actually create more stress or did it actually bring some joy in your particular day? There's a lot of research to say that actually developing affirmations and gratitudes, particularly even gratitude journal. So Martin Ziegman, the, the kind of godfather of positive psychology, has done a lot of work around this area that actually we develop. And it's just writing maybe a simple uh, gratitude of what your a daily affirmation of what you're grateful for at the end of the day. And what they actually found with people that six months actually in to the actual research that people's happiness was actually still on the increase by actually just writing down daily affirmations. So like affirmations really are to the mind what exercise is to the body. It helps eliminate limitate thoughts and negative beliefs as well. But it's again, and it's engaging in purposeful, deliberate practice in relation to gratitude. Again, it's something you can control and writing it down is really important because if you don't, if you don't ink it, you, you will not think it. So that's a simple tip that we can all take and, and uh, integrate into our, our daily lives and start from actually today as well. And maybe think about maybe a, a kind of a healthy daily affirmation that might actually help you. So replacing I can't with I can, or I am, or I'm strong, or I am ready. So just brief positive statements that you're able to repeat to yourself to kind of help you again, keep you also focused and motivated to work and achieve the goals that Jerry's going to Jerry's going to develop with you as well. So a little task that I would ask you to do is, could you maybe start a gratitude journal this tonight from tomorrow? Or could you develop an affirmation over the coming week to really help you focus on what you can control? So just another thing to think about um, is that really find in quiet times in what has, what has been a really unprecedented uh, time as well. So thinking about your own self-care behavior. Self-care is not a luxury, nor is it a, a selfish indulgence. We invest a huge amount of time, particularly coaches, in things and in other people, but sometimes we give very little to ourselves. And if we don't look after ourselves, we can't look after players or teammates or the people that we care about as well. So that's really important to kind of find quiet times and develop emotional and physical space for ourselves is, is, is crucial for self-care. And this time has really allowed people to think about their behaviours, their, their choices, their work-life balance, all, all, of, all of those things. So again, what is self-care for you and what does it look like 
Um, can you engage in that or do you need to actually schedule those particular self-care sessions in the same way as you schedule in a webinar, the same way as you schedule in a meeting for work? You need to maybe possibly schedule in self-care practices and that could be something simple like, like going for a walk as well. But also think about that rest, recovery, um, also aid in immune, uh, boosting your immunity as well. So these things are important to manage your actual stress at these particular times. It's also probably worthy, worth thinking about for some people or some households to schedule solidarity times. It doesn't have to, you have to go out and have a hit session out the back garden. For some people, C19 has been like the longest Christmas ever with your family, mixed with the Big Brother household thrown into one as well. So again, those withdrawal sessions for your own headspace. And that could literally be walking around the corner from your house, sitting on a rock and just letting yourself decompress. That's really important as well. But it'll also, again, help you manage your any kind of stress or any anxiety that you're actually feeling as well. And things like non-conscious kind of strategies, so blue or green exercise, so physical activity in coastal areas, beaches or inland waters, lakes, rivers, canals, that type of thing. You actually kind of get an extra bonus to manage your stress and, and decrease your anxiety levels from being in, being in uh, coastal areas or green exercises. So in any, engage in any exercise, any physical activity in nature, urban parks, anywhere like that as well. So think about where you engage in some of these withdrawal sessions. You can get extra actual kind of, I suppose, a boost by engaging in blue exercise or green exercise as well. So something to, something to consider as well. So again, transition into play over this particular time, too little challenge is a barrier, but too much challenge can also be a barrier to actually your athletes achieving and setting, setting their goals at this particular time. We have a really new baseline and a new starting point from where we're returning from. We're not picking up where we left off in March. So as a coach, you must strike the balance over the coming weeks to find the balance between challenging to hit those goals, but also give them the support that they need. And that might be emotional. It could be instrumental support. Uh, it could be, uh, again, just linking them to maybe some sports science support. They may need support to, to really help aid that transition to play as well. But also from a coaching kind of perspective, have high expectations that your players can actually meet the challenges that, and these goals that we're actually setting them and trust that they can do it too. We don't need to micromanage. We have to kind of instill that they do have the ability, the motivation, the skills that they could actually hit these goals that we're setting, but we would provide help as, help as necessary. So really what we're talking about here is you may have heard the Pygmalion effect or the Rosenthal effect is at play here. So we have, we should have as coaches, high expectations uh, lead to generally better performances and low expectations of players and lead to worse performances. So again, getting that balance right to cultivate the purpose and challenge with the goals that you set for them as well. It will also, again, aid your players to grow their optimism and that, again, optimism is something that we have to, to work at. And again, we're talking about optimism with a, with a dog lead. Again, not blind uh, optimism in the face of something that's unreachable as well. Again, something again to, to, to reiterate to, to your players as well, everyone has been equally disadvantaged and every player has just experienced the longest off season of their playing career. It isn't something that's just happened to that particular player, to this, this particular to this particular team. So we're all in the same boat and we're all coming from a completely different starting point where we did before. Okay, so I'm gonna hand you over to Jerry now, who's gonna set some target outcomes and give you some skills about how to actually weather the storm. Thanks, Kira. That, that, that was great. And hi, everybody. Um, to start off, I, I, I'm starting here with the, the term weathering the storm, um, because for a large part, it strikes me that we've come through the, the C-19 storm or we're coming out the other end of it. And during that storm, we were provided with targets. Uh, the government gave us a target of March the 29th for the first phase of a lockdown. Then there was a target in April, target in May. And now as we come out, the phased uh, return to, to, to opening everything up again is all done with targets in mind. And, and that's, that pandemic has been a, tar a storm that we probably didn't really want to experience, but 
for the most part, please God, we've all weathered it. Now there's another storm coming. Um, that storm is championship. And you're getting back to, to training with your players, getting back to your teams, looking forward, hopefully, to, to whatever kind of competition you have coming up. And I think we all know that when, when competition comes around, um, there is a different type of storm, the heat of battle, the, the, the energy, the expectation, the excitement, uh, the, the win, the loss, the success, the failure, the disappointment. And, and, and this all brings something in a very, very quick time. Um, and from like what Kira said, we just had the longest off season in history. And now we're going into probably the shortest preseason in, in history. Um, so just moving on in slides there, uh, Kira's doing the kicking of the slides for me, so she's in control of everything here. It strikes me by the end of this session tonight, we both, we both have given you a ton of work to do, so I apologize for that in advance. Uh, University of Alabama football coach Nick Saban is, um, is famous for uh, popularizing the term the process. And his emphasis was on not looking at the big picture, the big championship game, the finals, but focusing on the small moment by moment individual actions that we can all execute well all the time. He, he talks about winning happening brick by boring brick. And it strikes me from Kira's talk in terms of resilience, in terms of affirmations, looking after yourself, that this process is what you as coaches go through every day in terms of taking care of yourself, but also what you do in terms of the athletic development of your, of your players and the development of your teams. And the mental skill that's most associated with this approach of brick by boring brick, I, I might leave out the boring bit after this because we want it to be a bit exciting, but the primary mental skill is goal setting. And that's the strategy that we really um, want to encourage um, most coaches to try to implement with their players and their teams. And the rest of this, the rest of my section of this will really be about trying to give you the background as to why that's important and how to do it most importantly. And the, the, the little quotation at the top there, the pain of not achieving your goals will always be greater than any pain it may take to achieve them. And I, I want to give you a little um, example of, of, of a, a story that, that I, I really like. Um, if you ask yourself the question, who or what inspires your players? What is the inspiration that the players you coach have? And Way back in the in the 70s, a guy called John Faber was inspired. He was a swimmer, an American swimmer. He was inspired by Mark Spitz winning seven gold medals in the 1972 Olympics. And Mark Spitz inspired John Faber so much that he he set a goal for himself of winning a 100 meter backstroke gold medal in the 76 Olympics. But the problem for John Faber was the current record was 56.3 seconds and his best time ever had been 59.5. And he reckoned to win a gold medal in the 76 Olympics, he'd have to swim 55.5. So he had four years to knock four seconds off 100 meters backstroke. But John, John Faber um, was probably the greatest exponent of goal setting because what he did was he, he broke it down. He had to knock one second off a year for four years. But then in the 70s, most swimmers at Olympic level trained 10 months of the year. So he figured that was one tenth of a second per month that he had to knock off his time. Then he looked at his week. He trained six times a week. So that really brought it down to one three hundred of a second. He had to knock off his time every week. And then he trained for four hours a day. So that really brought it down to one twelve thousandth of a second per hour in order to achieve his dream of winning an Olympic gold medal. Now, to give you an idea of, of, of how small that is, one, 20, one twelve thousandth of a second is faster than a blink. 
Now, in the Olympics in 76, John Faber won the 100 metres backstroke in a world record time of 55.49. And he also won the 200 metres backstroke in a, uh, in an Olympic record time. So the key here was small, specific, measurable goals. But there may be a barrier to taking the approach John Faber took. And, and one of the barriers in terms of setting specific, precise goals is our fear of failure. Um, and this can prevent us from rely on, relying on hopes and aspirations rather than hard, measurable, precise goals. Now, this brings me on to, to your role as a coach in terms of goal setting and, and your team. There are two things, on, two things on the field that players want to do. Sorry, there are things on the field that players want to do, but there are also things that players need to do. And one of the key jobs for the coach is to marry the two of these together. So when we move on, Kira, thanks. Um, we know from the research that teams that are led by coaches who use goal setting as, as a mental skill, they're better able to think clearly under pressure. They have higher team cohesion. Those teams play better together. They work harder for each other. They're more focused on achieving team goals. Now, if you just look at those, some of those skills there, thinking clearly under pressure, um, working really hard for each other and staying focused, they're, they're performance skills. They're at the upper end of the mental skills pyramid. Goal setting is at the bottom of the pyramid. Goal setting is a foundation mental skill. If you have the foundation skill of setting good goals and holding yourself account to your goals, then you have a great base on which to build the performance skills at the upper end of, of the pyramid. Um, so we make the distinction here between goals aspirations and hopes because I think they're 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 somewhat different. So again moving on everybody knows something about goal setting these days. And probably everybody would say that yeah I have goals. I have life goals, I have career goals, I have sporting goals. But I think there's a difference between having goals and actually goal setting. And the idea of goal setting is that it's a practice and a commitment that you make that bridges the gaps between the hopes that you have and the fears that you have. So if I can refer back to Kira where she spoke about how different players will respond differently to the pandemic and the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, some of them will have had very little difficulty with it. Some of them will have had a lot of anxiety with it. When we come to the new storm, the storm that's championship hurling, championship football. Um, I'm not really sure for those of you who are coaching younger teams, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, what your competition structure will be like. But certainly for the teams that are going back to possibly inter-county to club championship, those players are going to have hopes for this championship. But deep down, they're also going to have some fears, fears of not performing well, fears of getting knocked out after two games, fears of not making the team, fears of letting their teammates down, fears of letting themselves, their family down. And goal setting is a really, really good strategy to try to bridge the gap between those two. And in essence, what, what proper goal setting does is it, it gives us a strong vision as to why something is worth doing, what exactly we're trying to achieve and how we're going to achieve that. So what I'm talking about really here is systematic goal setting that helps bridge the gap between where the player is and the target that they want to achieve, that helps you achieve small incremental uh, changes, adjustments, developments, that helps players change what is to what is possible. Now, what I mean by that is what is the situation right now, but what is possible if I set some really good goals and then make the commitment to achieve those goals. 
Goals are also really good at helping monitor players' ability and knowing what the next step in their athletic development is for, for those players. And it also helps keep them focused. And it has a strong, a strong benefit to the, goal, to the coach if you have players who set and follow a goal setting, a goal setting strategy. So uh, again, Kira, thank you. Um, I, I, I think to me, this is a reality in my experience that I come across the whole time. Um, everybody wants the same outcome. An awful lot of players will have long term goals or outcomes for this year's championship for this year's season, provided everything goes according to plan. Everybody wants to win a championship, perform brilliantly, score, be an all star, get rewarded, be recognized, praised, acclaimed, be an impact player. Um, and everybody wants them because they are largely things that are outside the control of the player themselves. They're dependent on a lot of other factors. Not everybody wants to do our little circle of three things here. Identify specific targets that they want to achieve. Set out a clear process and vision for how they're going to go about doing that. And set the next best step goals by constantly monitoring the gap between where they are and where they want to be. And I think that's a very, very different process. So that leads us a little bit to recognizing something about our players. And I think one of the keys to one of the keys to coaching at any level um, and in any sport is, is how well you know your players. And all players are motivated by primary and secondary motivation. Now, primary motivation is it's intrinsic. It's derived from the activity itself. They love hurling. They love football. Um, that's all they want to do. And they'll go out and they'll spend time at their skills and their fitness because they just want to get better. Secondary motivation is where there's any form of influence not associated with the activity itself. It's, it's a motivation coming from the outside. Coaches are a secondary motivation. Parents winning medals, beating the rival parish, the rival parish, the rival club. And these are all secondary motivation influences. And we're all motivated by both. And, and, and both are necessary. But one is a much more powerful form of motivation in terms of sustaining young players in sport over a long period of time and in sustaining people when they're in pressure situations in sport. So a little exercise, this is a 30, ex 30 second exercise for you right now. Just maybe simply you can on a piece of paper, there's eight examples there of some actions or some things that happen in, in football and hurling the whole time. Can you simply identify which you think is primary and which you think is secondary. Um, you can just read through them and pick one yourself rather than write it down. 30 second exercise. So I, I think the answer to most of those is pretty straightforward. Any place where there is a reward or recognition coming from outside the player themselves is secondary. Any place where there is an internal sense of satisfaction is primary. It's, it's really the old John Wooden uh, definition of success being the peace of mind that comes from knowing that you've done everything you can possibly do to be the best that you are capable of, of being. Um, and with that, that this brings us to kind of the theory, and I, I promise I'll get onto something practical real quick after this. But but theories are kind of important because a theory is really it's a, a general rule that explains and predicts behavior. And we want to know our players. The more you know your players, and the more you know how they're going to respond to your coaching, to your style of coaching 
to your training sessions, how they're going to respond in games, then the better you can help them to develop as, as, as people and as athletes. So knowing what motivates them is important because it impacts on how they're going to perform in games. And goal setting as a mental scale is, is a really good way to create what the self-determination theory talks about as the three, re, three key factors in the self-determination theory, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And sorry, Kira, you just pop back there a second. Um, autonomy is the player's sense of control. So do they get to make decisions in their training? Do they make it, make, get to make decisions about their development as, as players? Goal setting provides them with an opportunity to make decisions. Do they have a sense of confidence? Is their confidence developing because they, they're mastering skills? And again, goal setting can specifically target things that are measurable and that they can see, yes, I have gotten better at that. So their sense of confidence develops. And relatedness, which I think is going to be a key factor in the return to play after the pandemic, but this is the their interaction with other people, their sense of purpose in being with other people and the relationships they have and the common goals that they share with their teammates. So not only are there individual goals, but there are team goals which enhance, which enhance this. And our intrinsic motivation is the type of motivation that is most self-determined, as you'll see in the next slide, which very briefly, um, look, if, if your players are in the orange or the yellow or whatever that color is it in between orange or yellow, it's a Julex paint color. If your players are down that end of the spectrum, any failure, any setback, any bit of adversity is going to be very, very challenging for them because they're dependent on external sources to keep them going. You'll probably find that players in those colors, they'll be physically, sorry, they'll be verbally committed. They'll say, yes, yes, of course, I want to train hard. I want to get better. I want to improve at this. But they'll be physically committed until there's a setback and then the commitment level will drop. If you can get your players into the blue, preferably, but even into the green, then now they're becoming more intrinsically motivated. Even their extrinsic motivation is beginning to turn more internal. There's a, a sense of awareness, a synthesis with the self. And now when there are setbacks, they're going to be resilient. Now when there's adversity, they're going to deal with it. Now when they're stressed, they'll reflect and think about what they need to do. And you as a coach will have a far greater opportunity to develop players and develop teams if you can get more players into that, that end of the, of the spectrum. OK, so look, uh, I think everybody has prob is probably familiar with the principles of goal setting. Smart goals, they should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant or realistic and they should be time phased. Now, I'm going to really come back to that again, maybe in the next slide, but I think this is something that, that most people are probably familiar with. However, before, before I start on this slide, I, I think knowing your players is really important. The communication you have or that you can have with your players if you implement the goal setting strategy means that you're probably going to get to know a little bit more about what I call their secret goals. Because I think every player has got some secret goals. They're not the ones they're willing to share with other people. But if you think back earlier, they may be the things that they want to do on the field, but not necessarily the things that you need them to do. So having a goal setting strategy opens the door for very useful conversations between coaches and athletes about how they can add something to their game. And for me, that's the key. If, if, if players are adding something to their game, then they're getting better. 
if coaches are encouraging and helping and guiding players to add something to their game, they're doing a great job coaching. So setting goals, I think, is something you can teach players to do and they can do it on their own. And they can come back to you with examples of their goals and have a conversation about them. And teams can set goals together, which can be a useful team building exercise, particularly uh, in, in some ways, I think it's funny that club championships and maybe even county championships this year could be much more similar to what, let's say, the Irish soccer team um, under 18s, under 21s or senior teams do when they play an international competition. They have less time together, so they have to find more ways, creative ways of getting things done quickly. Um, so long term goals, I'm not overly concerned with um, whatever the outcomes are. Those goals tend to be outcome orientated, but the short term goals are more performance and process orientated. So earlier on, we said having having good knowledge of why you're doing something. What it is you want to achieve, that would be your performance goal, how the performance goal is going to be achieved. That's the brick by boring brick. That's the Nick Saban idea of the process. Um, I think there's a sample of a goal coming up next. OK, great. So it's really useful to start with if you've got some data that you can use. Fitness test results are really, really good because they give you numbers and you can help players set new numbers that they want to achieve. Skills tests can also be useful. Maybe if you're a hurler, it's how many how many strikes off the wall from 10 meters in one minute with a clean catch. Um, now you have a number. So what you want to do is you want to get your players to set a performance goal. The goal should begin with the words I will, because that's a, uh, as Kira stated, that's an affirmation. I will. It's a positive statement of something that you are committing to do. So as an example here, I will reduce my 40 meter time from 4.6 to 4.2 by the end of July. That's specific. It's measurable. It should be attainable from 4.6 uh, to 4.2. Um, it's realistic and it's relevant to the game and it's time phased. Now, how is that going to be done? And here is the problem. A lot of players will have an aspiration to get quicker. They'll say, yeah, I want to develop my speed, so I'm going to train more. I'm going to do more sprints. That's kind of an aspiration. Um, it's almost kind of a hope I get quicker if I do this. Here in the process goal, we're, we're being much more specific. I will complete two sprint sessions each week for the next five weeks. That's going to be 10 sprint sessions in five weeks. If that's well coached and if it's done with some quality, there's a real chance that that performance goal is going to be achieved and the player, especially if they've identified this goal themselves, will have improved their autonomy, their competence and their relatedness. Um, sometimes it takes more than one process goal to get a performance goal. I think if you're dealing with young players and the best time to start goal setting is with young players because they'll buy into it quicker and it will become a habit with them. It's a harder sell with adults because they're more used to doing things in a particular way uh, before that. But a second goal here, I will increase my stride length so that my foot contacts over 40 meters are reduced from 20 to 18. So you don't even need GPS or cameras. You can simply count how many contacts they have over 40 minutes and if they can increase their stride length, along with stride frequency, they, they might be quicker. So two process goals supporting one goal. Sorry, Kira, back one step. Um, I think all of us probably know that when, when you get married, you're not actually married till you go behind the altar and sign the register. So it's important that they sign their goals. Um, you can't get a bank account without signing something. You can't get into college without signing something. Our signature is a commitment. And it's a really, really strong commitment. And 
I, I think that if you can get your players to sign their goals on a little card like this here, what you've really got now is something more than a goal. It's a performance contract. And I think it can be sold in a really effective way to players because players like that kind of language. Um, everybody would love a professional contract if it was a professional sport. But if you got a professional contract, you would have a performance contract with it. So signing the goal is really important. And then writing in the date that that goal will be achieved by. Now they're locked in. Now this is a goal as opposed to an aspiration or a hope. This is different from having a goal. This is a goal I have set. It's a performance contract. Um, again, Kira, thank you. Thanks. Um, so how do you as a coach um, implement the goal setting strategy? Um, I'm not going to read through these slides. Uh, I, I think they're pretty straightforward, but phase one is planning. So you teach them how to set goals. Maybe you help them set goals. You advise or talk or ask about what are the action skills that they'd like to improve. Maybe some guy's telling you, I want to score 10 points in the first half of every game. And you're going to have to jump in there and maybe advise them as to what they need to do to help the team. Um, decide on what can be measured. Is the goal they're setting measurable so that there's no arguments in the end about whether it was achieved or not? Write the goal down. Uh, that famous leadership expert or leadership expert Robin Sharma encourages uh, people to write their goals down because it helps you focus on that thought as opposed to the other 65,000 thoughts you'll have every day. So there's a, a, a proper mental focusing aspect to this. And then have a plan to monitor the goals and make them part of players training and match day performances. Maybe, maybe you, you, you get a little template and you write down the target that every player has set under individual goal setting. So you now have a list that you can check. I know a couple of years ago, I, I was fortunate enough to spend a couple of days um, in training camp with Clermont Ferrand uh, rugby team in France. And beside their changing room, they had, uh, they had a little, what they call their data room, where every player's goals for the month across physical, technical, tactical, mental, nutrition, body weight, etc., were all written up on, on goal cards on the wall. And players were expected to go in and hold each other to account on those goals. Um, maybe not something you would do with younger players, but certainly in a team, my goals and me achieving my goals will directly impact on you achieving your dream of winning the championship, having a great season, etc. The second phase is the implementation phase. And really, this is a little just repetitive um, of what I've said already. Set the goals because you, you, you set goals that you have control over, control the controllables. Base your goals on personal performances. And I think two process goals to one performance goal, and maybe two performance goals for a cycle of four or five weeks is more than enough for, for most people. Um, begin everything with I will, or if it's a team goal, we will. Keep it precise like the example of the 40 meters. Write them down on something nice, something neat, an index card, a goal sheet. Sign them, have a deadline date. Really important, put the goal card or goal sheet where you will see it several times a day. Don't put it in a in in in, in a, a drawer and then you'll forget about it for five days. Put it on the bathroom mirror, on your bedside locker, on the locker room, in the car where you see it the whole time. And then finally, um, I think for 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 team goals, which is is a slightly different matter, it's very important that there's some system in place where these can be monitored. And that brings me to the last slide, um, the monitoring and evaluating. So as a coach, all you really need is to have an Excel sheet or uh, an A4 piece of paper 
with all the goals written down with the target so you can monitor and you have that conversation with the player for a couple of minutes during each goal cycle. Are you working on your goal? How is it going? Do you think you're going to hit the target? That's brilliant. Keep it up. Link their goals to their match day role. I think this will build resilience when they're under pressure in games. They know that there is a relationship between their goals and their role on the team. And finally, when they do achieve the goal, have them write in big letters success right across the goal card so that they can see it and reinforce with positive feedback their achievement of the goal um, and let them see it. And then the final thing you have to do, which finishes this for me, is you use those three words, set, do, review. Set your goals, do them and review them. And that process is repeated every phase of your season throughout the season. OK, so I'll hand you back to Kira. Thank you. Super, Jerry. Thanks a million. So seeing as Jerry has said that your signature is your seal, um, just going to ask you to reflect and to wrap up and using the traffic light system to help you focus and link, link to your goals. Can you think about one thing that you're going to stop doing? Think of one thing that you're going to start doing or one thing you're going to continue doing based on what we've gone through tonight. So I'm just going to give you 30 seconds to write down what you're going to stop doing, start doing or continue doing. So this might just help you focus again and link to some of the practical strategies that we went through tonight for you. So then just to, to wrap up and, and go into a quick, quick Q&A, just to finish off with the, 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 the famous John Wooden. Remember, don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. And setting your goals is exactly something that you've complete control over. So thanks a million to everybody. Thanks a million, Kira. Um, you might, yeah, you might stay with us for the moment uh, yourself and Jerry. We we have a few minutes. We can go through some of the questions that that were that were mentioned. Uh, just one bit, a small bit of housekeeping, Kira. You mentioned a podcast that you were listening to earlier in the week, and a couple of questions on. People didn't get the name of the podcast. Do you, do you remember what that was? Yeah, the, the sports psychologist is the name of the podcast. It's up there on it's on Spotify. Yeah, Did you get that? I I'll type it into the chat here for everyone. Yeah. Um, question from John. Then um, you mentioned positive psychology and and transitioning to play and the need to strike a balance between challenge and support. What tips would you give to start the discussion with a player that is struggling? Um. Yeah. Like really dealing with the person first and the player second, that's really important. So really meeting the person where they at, are at in front of you. So just really striking up a conversation about how they are, how they've been coping, uh, what strategies have they used against you, using the positive spin on things, but dealing with the person first and the player second, and then maybe addressing what kind of help or strategies do they need to actually support them in this transition period as an actual player. But Really, I think it's starting with the human first is, is 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 most important. Do you want to throw on Anthony there, Jerry? Uh, I, I um, only I suppose it depends on the age and and experience of the player. But if they're adult players, I think conversations about you know what their hopes and fears are for be it the coming season or coming out of this is is um, is always a good point. Um, because if, if you're human, you have hopes and you have fears. So just really getting to to maybe talk a little bit about them is is, is sometimes useful. Sorry, I assume, I assume the person was an adult. That's a, just again tailing your answer. It's to okay. It, an adult or a child, yeah. Um, Jerry, just a question that's come in from a couple of different people, similar enough type of question. Can you talk about maybe 
goal setting for the younger player, the child player or the younger teenage player? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I, I think, and, and there is substantial research to support that younger players, particularly players under the age of 14, 14, 13, 14, 15, that if they develop the habit of setting goals, um, then it's a habit that they tend to carry with them into future life. So I think just teaching the goal setting pro uh, process and maybe allowing them to select the goals that they want to pick. Um, they don't necessarily, if they're younger players, have to be about skills or physical fitness, um, certainly not about winning. And I think the one key uh, thing I would promote there is that the, the goals that they set are about their own athletic or personal development. And it can be as simple as, I. I just want to enjoy my hurling more. Okay, ask them to scale it from one to 10. How much are they enjoying it at the moment? Um, and what number would they like to get to? And that's the gap that you want to bridge. And then it's a conversation after that about what would make it more enjoyable. Very often they'll say, well, just play games at training and don't do anything else. I say, well, okay. We might be able to do that all the time, but how much of training could be devoted to that? And, and, and now you're educating them a little bit about what training is, um, because sometimes maybe they arrive thinking that it has to be just all about having fun um, as opposed to enjoying the experience. It's not just having a laugh. That's probably not the best example, but I think broach it around very much about what they want to change or develop or improve about themselves, their game, their movement, their level of fun, their level of enjoyment, etc. I think you have to ask some questions a little bit. I don't know if that's helpful. No, I think it is. And it's actually, you mentioned the goal there of enjoying playing hurling more. And that was actually something that was in my mind as you were, uh, you know, talk about the question that sometimes we can say well I want to get you know from 10 strikes against the wall in in 30 seconds to 12 strikes against the wall in 30 seconds and maybe for a young player that might almost turn them off the game as much as uh, it might motivate a more a more older player for example. Uh, absolutely uh, that, that's probably very much brick by boring brick but I think scaling questions are really good with young players on a scale of 1 to 10 how how do you feel or what do you think of this and, and if it is enjoyment, if it's fun, um, and they say, well, at the moment, it's only a four, um, what, what would have to happen in order to get it to a seven? And let them give you the answer, but then ask them to set some goals for themselves about how they can be part of enjoying it more. So we're less than two weeks away from a return to training. Um, and after the gap we've had, like you said, the, possibly the longest preseason in, or sorry, the the, the longest off season that that uh, many players have ever had. What what mental skill would be most important to work on in the lead up to return? Is that for Kira or me or Kira? Maybe Jerry, if you want to start, if you want to start, Jerry. Um, I, I, sorry, Kira. <laughs> No, my, my internet is struggling here. Just if yeah. I'm breaking up, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I think, um, I, I think prior to playing games, it's, it's probably motivation. I, I think it's the level of commitment that's required to be successful, and that they're bringing that level of commitment. Uh, I, I think commitment comes in, in, in three forms. It's, it's verbal, it's physical, and it's emotional, and. You know, everybody will be verbally committed now. Um, if you lose the first game in the championship, you may not be committed after that. People will be physically committed while things are going well. And when things stop to go well, the effort levels can drop. But the emotional commitment is not everybody brings that. Not everybody brings all three. And the emotional commitment is is really about where people are taking responsibility, they're, they're taking the initiative, they're driving things on, they're actively looking to make training more enjoyable, more challenging, more competitive. 
Um, they're trying to build a team and build a culture um, in an active, uh, innovative kind of way. Um, so uh, for, for me, like, you know, when, when anything happens, when confidence or concentration gets hit, then commitment is the first thing that's likely to drop. So I think prior to playing games, it's trying to increase the level of commitment, not just verbally, because that's easy, but physically and emotionally or mentally as well. Mm -hmm. Do you want to come in there? Yeah, just, I, I echo what Jerry is saying there, but yeah, con consistency, but we, it's such a short lead in time and kind of to, to link to what Jerry was saying, you may need to break it down to really, it's consistency in behaviour, consistency in thinking, consistency in, in emotions. Um, and kind of sim simple strategy might be something like your daily decisions determine your destiny. So really breaking it down into daily milestones of small things that they can have an accumulator effect of that you can reflect on at the end of the week that you've done this extra, you've, you've taken this many extra shots, you've done this particular workout at home. So really evidence based thinking for developing their commitment to which will hopefully develop their confidence o o over time. Um, so much smaller bite sized goals that they get it that they that they that they can accumulate quicker and i think one of the things that will be there is that some players will be absolutely bursting at the seams yeah. to get back uh, and and motivation won't be you know an issue there but other people like you said for various different reasons over the last 12 13 14 weeks they might be just that little bit uh, dulled in their motivation uh, and a couple of questions have come in about that, and I think you've dealt with, with a lot of those just, just now. Um, and I want, want to maybe have uh, just a couple of more questions as, as we go, just to, just to finish up. Um, and there's, there's a few, there's a number of questions coming in and lots of people asking about how we make it relevant to, to various different groups that they are working with and so on. Um, and maybe one of the questions that we might look at then is, for for those players that that have have fallen out and maybe dropped out uh, almost in their own minds, uh, and there might be some a number of players that are in that in that space right now, or even players that decide you know maybe they are vulnerable or, or there are people vulnerable in their house or there might be frontline workers or, or various different things like that that they might say do you know something I might I might skip this year and come back next year. Mm. How do we how do we try and avoid that dropout to make sure that people do come back? Uh, even if it's not immediately. Yeah, I think it's about having individualized conversations. It's not something I would have, you know, in a group meeting or a group team going, look, if anybody needs any help, let me know or put your hand up or anything like that. It's really to approach players one to one and, and, ha and have those conver conversations and then respect decisions or see if there's a role that they can play from uh, maybe if they, if they still want to be part, but maybe don't want to play, maybe they can deal with some performance analysis, they can come along, they can help, or um, they, there could be some some other backroom role for, for a particular particular player. Um, a few any ideas, Jerry, about engaging? Yeah, people? no, I, 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 think here, I think here is here is bang on, you know, it's individual conversations. And, and I know, I'm 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 experiencing that at the moment with some teams that are just coming back and there's pressure on players to play because they're an important part of the team but that player really experienced their experience of the whole lockdown has put them in not the best place and maybe they would prefer not play but then they're letting people down and it's it's very very difficult um decision you know are you going to let your teammates down? But at the same time, um, are you letting yourself down? I, I think the individual conversations in a manner where people can say, look, this is what I would really like right now. This is what I would really like. And I, I guess it's really difficult for coaches because they're the person left making, they're the person that has to engage and try to find a compromise, they have to negotiate. There's a lot of coaching skills there, which I think are going to put coaches under more pressure than players, because at the end of the day, <laughs> the finger is going to be pointed at the coach 
based on how the team performs. Um, but I, I think the most important thing is that, like Kira said, you try to have individual conversations with players um, before or after or between training sessions to find out what their level of motivation is and what's impacting on that motivation. If, if it's if it's family or business or things that are, are really big and serious, then that's one problem. But if it's something as simple as I, I didn't do as much as I should have done during the lockdown and now I'm fearful that I'm going to let myself down when it comes to playing. Um, that can be a real concern for players, but that's a surmountable problem. Um, but yeah, individual conversations, absolutely. Uh, we might we might finish up with with this question, and it's a sort of a left field question, Jerry. That's after coming in um, oh about your, your your love of basketball and so on. Um, and I suppose you did watch the Michael Jordan documentary, um, The Last Dance, on Netflix, and some of, some of our people are wondering what do you what could you take from that as a coach? <laughs> well, during that period, I was a Detroit Pistons fan, so. Um, I actually didn't really like the Bulls that much. So, <laughs> um, I, for, for you know, I, I really enjoyed the series and, and Jordan and uh, was such, you know, such an incredible player and such a unique, um, almost once in a, a 50 year phenomena. But um, I just really like Phil Jackson and the way he man managed the team. Um, the level of skill that he had to have to deal with, uh, you know, Dennis Rodman going to Vegas and keeping Jordan on side and still getting those guys to play at the level of intensity um, was was a massive man management skill. Um, Phil Jackson said that selflessness is the soul of teamwork. And I kept looking for that in the series, but it was hard to hard to see. But I, I think it's it's a it's a great advertisement for what really really great coaches can do um, when they tend to put the welfare of the players right up there with winning. Obviously, Phil Jackson had to win, but he really did try to accommodate the individual needs of players as best he could within that. And and um, I I was a big Phil Jackson Phil Jackson fan, but it, I kind of hope that the Pistons would would beat them a couple of times during that series. Here, do you want to add to that? No, I I, leave, I, I let the, I let the guru finish the last jo word. <laughs> jo Jordan was Jordan was a great goal setter. <laughs> um, I would recommend um, there's a particular app called Tackle Your Feelings. Um, it's just a, it's a, a free app that you, any coach can use uh, or any any player, any athlete can use. Uh, free in the iStore, free um, in uh, in the Google Play stores or whatever. Um, but it's very sports specific as well. There's great worksheets in it. There is some resources in it for sleep, for meditation, for visualization. It's developed by I think it's a Arupa. The Irish Rugby Players Association, um, and it's very Irish as well. It has Irish accent stuff, and very, very user friendly. So, if you're looking for some kind of resource to recommend to players or for to use yourself, just download it on your tablet or on your on your phone. Perfect. I think it's a great way to finish up for the session this evening. Kira and Jerry, thank you very much for uh, everything for this evening and for all the work that you put in over the last number of weeks. Um, must be a month or so, almost at this stage, since we first chatted about this session. Um, so we're delighted with it. I have to say, it's one of the most interesting sessions we've had over the whole 12 or 13 weeks um, or that that we've we've had this lockdown. And um, for for people on the call, next week will be the last week of the live sessions, and our plans after that is to is to continue maybe with one webinar per week, but we'll release it on on the GA Learning YouTube uh, instead of having the live sessions because of of people being back to training and and so on. Next week's, uh, for those of you who, who did attend the GA Return to Play uh, webinar last Tuesday, all of those resources are available on the GA Learning webpage. So you can go on there and get the video of the of the session, the slides, the materials and resources that were presented there. We have a session 
next Tuesday. There's been a group working in the background over the last couple of weeks on trying to identify and put together some resources for coaches about on-field activities that you can use over the next number of weeks as we get back to training with the restrictions around social distancing and, and, and playing numbers and coach numbers and so on. So we're going to have that session next next Tuesday evening at 7.30. So um, we're going to have Martin Fogarty, who's the National Hurling Development Manager. We're going to have Stephen O'Shaughnessy from Dublin. He's the Football Development Officer from Dublin. And Niall Williams, who's the Coach Education Coordinator for Camogie, are all going to be involved on Tuesday next in presenting that session. So it's going to be a really, um, a really interesting session on resources that have been developed that you guys can use when you're back coaching your teams on the, on the field of play over the next over the next number of weeks. So uh, the registration for that session will open. It will actually open tomorrow. There's a, a slight issue with the website tonight. Uh, I couldn't update it with the appropriate material. So that session will open tomorrow. But I'll be in contact and email everyone with the with the details of how to register from tomorrow morning. So for us tonight, we want to say thank you very much again to Jerry and to Kira. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming on the call and hope every, everybody enjoys their weekend and hopefully we'll see you back here all again next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.